right friends welcome back to main events of fifth week from 1st february to 7th february and if you look at the highlights the most unfortunate incident avalanche in siachen glacier region at a height of around 19600 feet the world's highest defense post killed 10 soldiers hanumantappa was found alive miraculously after 6 days but finally he lost in battling for his life then jika public health emergency of international concern this was declared by world health organization 10 years for mahatma gandhi narega we are going to see what are the plus points and minus points of mahatma gandhi narega during these 10 years curative petition of section 377 of ipc referred to constitution bench by the supreme court there is a ray of hope for lgbt community then implementation of one rank one pension formally declared by the government gesc deferred the decision on genetically modified mustard this is the first food crop proposed to be introduced but the genetic engineering appraisal committee the apex body deferred the decision then some decisions taken by ccea like increasing the minimum support price of uh, copra we are going to discuss then uh, indian basmati rice finally set to get the geographical indication tag and international fleet review was held at visakhapatnam this is the second international fleet review held in india the first one in mumbai in the year 2001 then north korea conducted a missile test but says it launched a satellite and it is going to escalate tensions between north korea and south korea let us look at the events the first and the most unfortunate event is avalanche at the world's highest battlefield that is the siachen glacier claimed lives of 10 soldiers of madras regiment out of 10 one soldier hanumantappa from dharwad in karnataka found alive miraculously after 6 days finally he succumbed to the injuries and if you look at the details about this siachen glacier it is situated at a height of 19600 feet and it is the world's highest battlefield and indian army has been controlling the area since 1984 and indian army occupied this area under operation meghdoot in the year 1984 and it is in the eastern part of karakoram range in the himalayas you may ask karakoram range please look into this slide karakoram range extends from afghanistan through pakistan into india and towards the eastern part of these mountains this siachen glacier is situated and it almost borders the pak occupied kashmir on one side and chinese occupied kashmir on the other side and please don't forget the lowest temperatures go up to minus 50 degree centigrade and annual snowfall goes up to 10 meters that is 1000 centimeters and on fateful day what happened complete blocks of snow and ice had fallen on the post burying it very deep and 10 soldiers of madras regiment lost their lives and what is the need of manning this siachen glacier now discussion started whether is it required to man siachen glacier or not and if you look at the history all of you are well aware about the line of control though india claims sovereignty and we maintain the situation that entire jammu and kashmir is a sovereign part of india but the ground reality is different line of control is there line of control is between pakistan and india and this line of control separates pakistani military on the other side indian military this side and the other portion is called pakistan occupied kashmir but please don't forget india claims the sovereignty on this region also and similarly if you look at towards the eastern side there is a 
line of actual control line of actual control delineates between chinese occupied kashmir and india so that is the line of military positions of chinese army and indian army and let me repeat once again though india claims that jammu and kashmir is integral part of india but on the ground chinese military came up to some distance that is known as line of actual control and pakistan military came up to some line that is line of control and unfortunate part is this line of control is delineated only up to certain point that is nj9842 and beyond that point it was left to the interpretation basically in the karakoram ranges and in those ranges india and pakistan interpreted this line of control in different ways that's why india occupied this siachen glacier under operation meghdoot in the year 1984 and subsequently india is manning this siachen glacier and in that area several lives were lost and in the adjacent glaciers pakistan lost several of its troops in these type of avalanches and for india this is one major avalanche in the siachen glacier region and now discussion is going on whether india is required to man this siachen glacier or not and the defense minister says that manning of siachen glacier is required in the national interest right friends if you look at the next event jika jika became the public health emergency of international concern and this disease originated in the year 1947 in uganda first it was detected in monkeys in jika forest of uganda and subsequently it was noticed in tanzania and in the year 2013 it came up in big way in french polynesia please look into this picture this is a french polynesia this is near australia and new zealand but 2015 marks the biggest arrival of this zika especially in latin american countries please look into this picture these are latin american countries latin american countries are the countries just below united states of america spread across both north america and south america including caribbean region so this is the area worst affected and now this zika virus spread to 26 countries as per the who statistics and predominant of them are brazil colombia venezuela and it is suspected that 1.5 million cases have already been affected with zika virus and by the end of 2016 it is expected that it may infect 4 million people mostly in latin american countries and in view of its spread to 26 countries world health organization if you ask me what is the world health organization it is the organization established in the year 1948 it was established on april 7 which we celebrate as the world health day and this is geneva based organization and it is authorized to declare any disease as public health emergency of international concern and around one and a half year ago ebola was declared as a phic and now this disease that is zika is declared as phic so now what will happen once it is declared as phic once any disease is declared as phic then more money will flow in then more research may lead to discovery of vaccine to fight the virus and one more point i would like to tell you infection with zika virus in pregnant women is suspected to have led to microcephaly microcephaly is the disease that is a deformation of a brain that means brain will not grow to its normal size and in recent times 4200 children were born with microcephaly in brazil and in view of all these things this disease was declared as public health emergency of international concern and if you want more about zika virus please listen to this week's news analysis we deliberated in detail about zika virus and what is the way out in future all those things and what is india's reaction if you want all these things please listen to news analysis 
right friends look at the next one mahatma gandhi narega mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act all of you are well aware it was started on february 2 2006 and as per this act all the rural population of 18 plus age group will have right to 100 days of employment and it was applauded world over as the best social security program and rural hinterland across the country was saved from the vagaries of monsoon because in our country till date around 60% of agriculture is basically rain fed because of that this mahatma gandhi narega saved several rural people from the vagaries of monsoon and this was started by the then prime minister manmohan singh on 2nd february 2006 and so far 3 lakh crores were spent on this program and another important point is around 57% of all workers are women and 65% of the works are linked to agriculture and allied activities and the unfortunate aspect is during the past few years the allocation in the budget is coming down and this year's budget the allotment was rupees 34699 crores and if you look at the positive and negative aspects the first and the foremost is i am looking at both the positive as well as negative aspects the first and the foremost positive aspect is it has played its key role in alleviating rural distress the second point is it made the rural people to withstand the vagaries of monsoon third one is it increased the nutritional standards of the people another important point is it created a demand in rural areas and possibly that is one of the reason for increased gdp growth when this mahatma gandhi narega was given high allocations then another thing is most important it induced self confidence in rural masses that something is there to take care of our needs if things are not going well and if you look at the negative aspects the most important aspect is it is commented for being used for digging of holes that means it could not create much productive assets most of the times minor repairs were taken in tanks and adjoining areas but overall you can say the productive assets creation is much less second important point is there are comments that it made the rural people lethargic third one is it created a labor shortage in the rural areas and it resulted in increase in rural wages abnormally during the past 7 to 8 years and of course in some states there were leakages reported in the implementation of mahatma gandhi narega and there are some positive aspects more than anything else it is definitely a tool to take care of vagaries of monsoon in rural areas not only that it acted as poverty alleviation measure in rural areas to some extent and more than that it created or induced self confidence in the masses of rural people and most important and negative aspect is rural people became lethargic created the labor shortage labor wages increased so these are all the negative aspects so you have to weigh both before taking further decision but the way out it appears to be in future it should concentrate on creation of productive assets that is the most important aspect which was missing during its first 10 years of implementation look into the next one curative petition on section 377 of uh, indian penal code referred to constitution bench and you may ask what is the curative petition the first one is judgment after the judgment people can approach with the review petition and after the review petition was also quashed the third and the last remedy is a curative petition right so this curative petition with regard to the section 377 of ipc section 377 of ipc basically with regard to homosexuality and 
this issue was referred by Supreme Court to five judge constitution bench. And if you want, what is the history of this case? And before going into the history, what is meant by section 377 of IPC? Section 377 of IPC says that sexual intercourse against the order of nature, that means homosexuality is punishable. And Delhi High Court on July 2, 2009 said that section 377 is violation of fundamental rights. The court felt that the individual's sexual preferences should not be punishable. That's why section 377 violates fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution under articles 14, 15 and 21 of the constitution. As section 377 of IPC is against the fundamental rights of the constitution, then Delhi High Court in the year 2009 crashed section 377. After the High Court judgment, the matter went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court set aside the Delhi High Court order and clearly stated that Section 377 does not suffer from the vice of unconstitutionality. That means what Supreme Court felt was Article 377 is not in violation of fundamental rights enshrined under the constitution. So, section 377 will stay and is legally sustainable. That means the Supreme Court stated homosexuality is punishable under section 377. Subsequently, in January 2014, the Supreme Court dismissed the bunch of review petitions also and now several gay rights activists filed curative petitions and now Supreme Court referred all these petitions to five judge constitution bench. The Supreme Court felt that there are larger issues to be decided in this. That is why it referred this to the five judge constitution bench. And please don't forget, after the judgment, the next step is review petition. After it, the next step is curative petition. And this time, the curative petition is being heard in somewhat different manner. And there are two differences I listed out here. First thing is, normally curative petition is heard by judges in chamber. But this time, Supreme Court agreed for open court hearing. The second important point is, normally curative petition looks at whether the review petition, as I have already told you, judgment, review, curative. So, normally curative petition looks at whether the review violated the principles of natural justice or the judges are biased. Curative petition is normally admitted to look at these two things. One is whether the review violated natural justice. The second one is whether the judges are biased. But in this particular case, Supreme Court opted for comprehensive hearing of arguments and to protect the dignity and the rights of LGBT communities, probably Supreme Court has taken this decision. Right. This is all about section 377 and curative petition and referring the matter to larger bench. Right. Look into the next one, implementation table of one rank one pension released. All of you are well aware, one rank one pension scheme basically looks at the persons with the same rank having put in same years of service irrespective of the rate of retirement should get the same pension that is one rank one pension and it fulfilled the demand of defense forces after a long gap of 42 years and it will benefit total 18 lakh ex servicemen and widows right and here government total recurring expenditure every year will be rupees 7500 crores and arrears will be there that is, government promised that they will implement from 1st July 2014. That is why for one and a half year, arrears comes to 10,900 crores of rupees. And budget for defense for pensions will go up by around 11,000 crores of rupees from 54,000 crores to 65,000 crores. Now, one rank, one pension is going to become a reality. 
Look at the next one, GEAC deferred decision on GM mustard. What is GEAC? GEAC is Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee. This is Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee. It is the apex body with regard to the introduction of genetically modified crops. All of you are well aware, genetically modified cotton is extensively grown in our country. But when it comes to food crops, this is the first food crop contemplated that is genetically modified mustard. And now the government deferred the decision with regard to commercialization of country's first genetically modified food crop that is the mustard. And do not forget GEAC, the apex body discussed the safety issues but subsequently deferred the final decision. As I have already told you, GEAC is the apex body to accord approval for large scale use and commercial release of GM crops in India. And at the same time, several farmers groups and green activists are against the commercialization of GM food crops. And please do not forget this GM mustard was developed by genetics department of Delhi University. And finally, I would like to tell you what is meant by genetic modification and why some people are for it and some people are against it. So, here what is genetic modification? Genetic modification is nothing but direct manipulation of an organism's genome by using biotechnology. And here I would like to introduce a term DNA. What is DNA? DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, right? It is the material inside the nucleus of cells and it carries genetic information. Please do not forget, DNA is the material inside the nucleus of cells carrying genetic information. So, what is being done in genetic modification? Basically, transfer of genes is being done. That means, transfer of genes will be done across the species boundaries to produce improved organisms. So, exactly what is being done? Certain enzymes, what is meant by enzymes? Enzymes are nothing but proteins and certain enzymes are used which can cut pieces of DNA of one organism. As I have already told you, DNA is inside the nucleus of cells. Certain enzymes are used which cut pieces of DNA of one organism and that piece of DNA is induced into DNA of another organism. Hence, the new organism is treated as genetically modified. That means, cutting DNA of one organism and introducing into the DNA of another organism, that is a genetic modification. This is being done by enzymes. Enzymes are nothing but proteins which speed up chemical reactions. And some people are for it. People or advocates of this uh, genetically modified crops says that it will result in increased yields and can feed increased populations across the world. But the people against genetically modified crops says that it is unethical. Second is they express concerns about human health if GM foods are eaten. But extensively in United States of America, majority of corn, soya bean, they are genetically modified. And across the world, there is difference of opinion. Some European countries do not allow genetically modified crops. But United States of America extensively use genetically modified crops. And look at the next issue, decisions taken by CCEA, Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. First one is delinking of Rajasthan Electronics and Instruments Limited Jaipur from its parent company Instruments Limited. And now REIL will become separate CPSE. Second thing is minimum support price of milling copra and ball copra increased. The minimum support price of milling copra increased by rupees 400 per quintal and ball copra increased by rupees 410 per quintal. And please do not forget the decision to increase the minimum support price will be taken by CCEA, but the recommendations are given by CACP that is 
Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices. So, based on the recommendations of CACP, this CCEA took the decision to increase the price of Baal Copra and Milling Copra. The other important point is, decision was taken with regard to coal linkages for non-regulated sectors. Non-regulated sectors are sectors like cement, steel, sponge iron, aluminium and in future coal linkage or coal allocation will be done only through auction route to ensure transparency. So, these three important decisions were taken by CCEA. Look at the next one, Indian Basmati rice is set to get the GI tag after 7 years of application. GI tag will be given for Basmati rice grown in several states. And why this matter took 7 years? Because there were objections from Basmati rice growing Pakistan. At the same time, there were objections from Basmati rice growing states like Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan. But this GI tag will be given for the Basmati rice grown in Indo-Gangetic plains abutting the foothills of Himalayas and these regions are Punjab, Haryana, Western Uttar Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand and two districts of Jammu and Kashmir. You can say north western part of the country in the foothills of Himalayas. That area for the Basmati rice grown, there is a separate aroma, distinct aroma is there, which is not there for the Basmati rice grown in Madhya Pradesh or Rajasthan. So, that is why that specific area will get this geographical indication tag. And here I would like to tell you few things. All of you are well aware about these things. Darjeeling tea, Mysore silk, Kanchipuram silk, Banarasi saris, Kashmir Pashmina, these are examples of geographical indication tags. And by saying geographical indication tag, that indicates the distinct quality with regard to particular region. Right? And I would like to tell you a few more points about this geographical indication tag. First and the foremost is, it is the place name used to identify the origin, quality, reputation. If I say Kanchipuram Saris, if I say Kashmir Pashmina, then it indicates quality and it indicates that it is manufactured or it has got its own reputation and distinctly linked to the place of origin. And its name conveys an assurance of quality and distinctiveness and it is used to identify agricultural, natural or manufactured goods. In these three categories, agricultural, natural or manufactured goods and they are covered as an element of intellectual property rights and under articles 22 to 24 of the TRIPS agreement. So, India brought this geographical indication of goods act of 1999. India brought this act in 1999 and it was implemented from 15th September 2003. Geographical indications registry is there. This is based in Chennai. Please do not forget, geographical indications registry is based in Chennai. That is the nodal agency for giving this GI tax. And this comes under Controller General of Patents, Designs and Trademarks. This geographical indications registry comes under Controller General of Patents, designs and trademarks under the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion that is Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So, patents, trademarks, geographical indications are looked after by Controller General of Patents, Designs and Trademarks which is under the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion that is DIPP under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And in this context, I would like to tell you one more point. Agricultural and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority that is popularly known as EPEDA is the statutory body responsible for export promotion of agricultural and food products and it is the nodal authority for this particular case for applying for GI tag. So, 
EPEDA is Agricultural and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority and this is under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Please don't forget. Some people will confuse that EPEDA is under Agriculture Ministry. No, it is for Export Promotion of Agricultural and Processed Foods. So, this is under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Right? So, GI tag is basically within the purview of Controller General Patents, Designs and Trademarks under DIPP Ministry of Commerce and Industry and EPEDA which basically looks at export promotion for agricultural and processed foods is also under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And if you look at Basmati rice, India exported 37 lakh tons of Basmati rice worth around 27,000 crores of rupees during 2014-15 and India is the world's leading exporter of Basmati rice and another important point is most of the Basmati rice goes to Gulf countries especially Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, Kuwait and Iraq. Right friends, International Fleet Review at Visakhapatnam. First International Fleet Review was held in 2001 in Bombay. This is the second International Fleet Review and I would like to tell you few things. Supreme Commander of Armed Forces is the President of the country. Then the theme for this year's Fleet Review is united through oceans and this was held at Visakhapatnam and basically as a supreme commander of armed forces the president of the country will take salute from other ships and the president conducted this fleet review aboard INS Sumitra that is known as the presidential act and in the presidential act the president has taken salute from other ships ships from India Around 22 ships of foreign navy also participated in international fleet review and the prime minister, defense minister also participated in international fleet review held at Visakhapatnam and this has got a political and diplomatic relevance and a strategic and security relevance also. Anyhow, this international fleet review was conducted in a massive scale towards the east coast that is in the city of Visakhapatnam in Andhra Pradesh. And please don't forget that is the headquarters of Eastern Naval Command also. North Korea conducted missile test, but it says it launched a satellite. The main purpose or you can say the intention of North Korea is to develop intercontinental ballistic missile or ICBM so as to strike United States of America. So, North Korea says it launched only satellite and USA says that it is not satellite, it is long range missile and immediately South Korea stated that it would begin talks with the United States of America on the deployment of advanced missile defense. Almost all the major countries condemned the launch. China expressed regrets and China is the biggest trade partner with North Korea. Only China can silence North Korea. But China is not acting on the expected lines because of the reason several Asian countries are at loggerheads with China with regard to South China Sea and at the same time America wants to establish its presence in South China Sea because of these reasons China is not silencing North Korea but the claim of a testing of a hydrogen bomb by North Korea during the month of January and the launch of missile in the month of February may lead to escalation of tensions in between the countries adjacent to North Korea, especially South Korea and Japan. And what will happen? These countries may ask for support from United States of America and which may in turn lead to escalation of tensions between China and the United States of America. Right friends, with this let us conclude the lecture part and please do join for other modules. Have a nice day. Thank you.